So just like we had seen that uh, despite the 25 years of negotiations, the uh, emissions have continued to rise, which is not good news. And despite this great knowledge of the uh, ways in which to mitigate SLCPs and the co-benefits and the dire need to do that and the immediate results that we'll get from doing that, uh, the action is not still at the level that it could be or should be at this point. So what is it that is making the countries uh, not jump up and act on these? Why are countries slow to act? Here are some reasons listed by the chapter, by the authors. Perhaps the most important reason is that combined climate, health and food security benefits of SLCP mitigation have only been recognized since about 2010. While scientific study of SLC SLCPs is at least 40 years old, scientists studying the health effects of SLCPs as air pollutants uh, were working separately from the scientists studying SLCPs climate impact. So there were two groups which were looking at very different aspects of SLCPs. The vital role that SLCPs, mit SLCP mitigation uh, can play in bending the warming curve has only begun to catch the attention of climate scientists in the last 10 years with Professor Ramanathan being one of the key proponents from his uh, papers from the 1970s talking about the impacts of uh, uh, various uh, short-lived climate pollutants on global warming, okay? From around the time that uh, Molina and Sherwood wrote the paper on C CFC impact on the ozone hole, for which I think they won the Nobel Prize in the end. Cost-benefit studies that show the combined societal benefits of SLCP mitigation from reduced warming together with health and food security benefits have only become available in recent years. Okay, so there is that delay as well. Until around 2010, the attention of climate scientists, activists and policymakers was focused primarily on CO2 emissions that made the most noise uh, with the testimony of uh, Jim Hansen and then earlier uh, statements by in the 1970s by um, Wally Broker and even the 1800s by uh, Ar Arrhenius, Swante Arrhenius and all have generally focused on CO2 and not so much on uh, so much on SLCPs. There was concern that a sudden shift in focus to SLCPs would create the impression that action on CO2 mitigation could be delayed or even avoided, presenting a moral hazard. So you have to be careful when there is so much controversy and denialism and exploitation of um, science, misleading science to you know, in misinform people, uh, using science to mislead people, using confusing words can be a, a great moral hazard. So if suddenly everybody says let's mitigate SLCPs uh, to reduce global warming then Obviously, there are vested interests which will say, ha ha, they said CO2 was important, now they are saying something else. Okay, that's a great danger, by the way. In all areas of environmental science, there is a time lag between scientific funding and policy response. Okay, that's something to remember. Okay, now moving on to the next uh, more specific actions on each of the uh, SLCPs. Let's start with mitigating black carbon. Black carbon uh, aerosols actually are a big part of the climate system and there are many direct and indirect processes through which uh, black carbon affects uh, climate and global warming. First of all, black carbon, it's black because it absorbs uh, light and energy Hence, it is uh, going to warm the climate, atmosphere, and it comes from all these sources like aircraft emissions and so on. Uh, it impacts ice cloud effects, uh, so warming or cooling f uh, from BC nucleation effects. So particles act as cloud condensation nuclei, 
and they can be warming or cooling depending on how the nucleation works. So black carbon direct absorption of incoming uh, and scattered solar radiation leads to atmospheric warming and dimming of the surface. So the radiation reaching the surface can be reduced which in some cases has been invoked for less land warming uh, compared to the ocean warming in the Indian Ocean region for example which has uh, a, a negative impact on monsoon. Okay, Heat capacity of land is lower so it should warm faster with global warming but if the incoming energy is reduced by pollution and black carbon then the land will warm uh, less than it could. Okay, so aerosol lofting by convection, mixed phase cloud effects. So there are indirect effects where the cloud microphysics or cloud properties, cloud formation processes, precipitation processes and so on are affected by uh, black carbon. So black carbon scavenging and wet removal by precipitation happens. There are dry deposition ways uh, as well and so on. So I won't go into the details here but you can sit and look at it but here are the sources of black carbon aerosol and co-emitted species. Uh, one thing we should mention though is that um, pollution in general, uh, black carbon in particular when it uh, gets deposited on snow and ice or glaciers uh, it's absorbing and actually begins to uh, increase the melting rates and there is even a hypothesis mentioned that maybe uh, end of the Little Ice Age around the late 1700s into 1800s uh, was initiated by the Industrial Revolution and the coal burning and the pollution depositing on the glaciers that had extended uh, pretty far down or at least frozen uh, land uh, water bodies or Netherlands and uh, so on, okay, and glaciers coming down further or Argentieri in the Alps and so on and so forth, okay. Agricultural burning, residential cooking, brick kilns, open burning, uh, coke making, uh, petrochemical flaring, off-road vehicles, uh, ship uh, shipping emissions and on-road cars and trucks, uh, of course, okay. So here is again a nice figure from CCAC, Climate and Clean Air Coalition of the UNEP. Uh, uh, black carbon and co-pollutants from incomplete combustion. Black carbon particles are formed from the incomplete combustion of biomass and fossil fuels. It's a powerful climate forcer and dangerous air pollutant. Its residence time in the atmosphere is only a few days. So here are the main black carbon rich sources by region uh, and sector as of 2005. Uh, the sectors here, biofuel, uh, resident biofuel cooking and heating, resident coal cooking and heating, uh, on-road diesel engines, off-road diesel engines and so on. But you can see there's a huge source here in Northeast uh, uh, Asia and uh, Pacific uh, uh, countries and the uh, Central uh, Asia, uh, Africa, North America and US and South America. Okay, Impacts we have already talked about. Suspended in the atmosphere black carbon particles contribute to global warming by absorbing energy and converting it to heat. So they are absorbing aerosols as opposed to scattering aerosols like sulfate which is also emitted by coal burning. Black carbon is a dangerous local air, po local air pollutant which can also be transported across the globe. Right? Its, uh, residence, days, its uh, residence time is short but once it's airborne it can be transported quite far. Black carbon is a dangerous, uh, okay that's already I said, uh, clean air, uh, clean clouds reflect sunlight but black carbon scavenged by clouds dims light coming to the earth's surface sooty clouds absorb light instead of reflecting uh, sunlight oops sorry changes in cloud and rain patterns for example there is some evidence that aerosols uh, like black carbon can produce a drizzle uh, and instead of bigger drops and actually can reduce total amount of rain for example and there is also evidence that they can cause extremes and so on. Okay, 
So black carbon ha harms human health, uh, impacts ecosystems. Uh, clean uh, snow and ice would reflect sunlight, but black carbon deposits on uh, ice and snow would increase uh, melting, obviously. Okay, so that's uh, black carbon uh, and obviously huge co-benefits of uh, mitigating black carbon uh, by, 20, let's say, 50% by 2030, which is totally doable.